Hello, everybody. How are you doing? It's a huge pleasure to be here with you today for our kickoff session of DevSecond Poland. Really, it's a huge pleasure uh, to be here, you know, to be uh, doing this kickoff session to introduce the new chapter of Poland here of DevSecond and, you know, counting on you, of course, share a lot of knowledge. Uh, it's just our first session. It will be a lot of sessions. Stay at you at the end of the live. I'll be announcing already our second session that will be happening. And it's, again, it's a huge pleasure. And I'm, I'm a bit nervous to make, uh, to be honest, but everything will be fine in the end. Okay, guys, uh, again, uh, we'd love, uh, you know, to hear from you if you need anything during the presentation, etc. Please just drop your comments, drop your quest questions uh, on the chat. I'll be uh, watching everything and trying to answer everything. Even if you are not uh, live, you are seeing this recorded after, which is a shame, but it's okay. Uh, anyway, drop your comments on the video. We will be trying to answer everything as soon as possible, okay? Of course, I'd like to invite you also to uh, join our Discord uh, channel. There, are, there is a, a Poland chapter there on Discord of DevSecom. Please join us there, of course, uh, during this live and during all the other sessions and all the time, actually, people will be there, speakers, me, myself, will be there to answer their questions, to make discussions and, you know, to share knowledge because this is the main go of the community and of the depth second chapters and etc to share knowledge and the power of knowledge make us free let's say like this okay so please join our discord channel you will enjoy even more okay once the session is over please uh, we'll be on our website also on the youtube channel the recorded session so you can share with your friends share with your knowledge uh, with other co colleagues and for sure will be helpful for them as well, okay? The idea today is to be talking about the real shift left. I prepared a presentation myself uh, to talk about this for you uh, and to make you understand a little bit uh, that we need to stop only finding problems during our cycle of uh, software development, but instead we should stop creating the problems. Now that, that's, the, that's the main idea, but uh, ideally, it's hard to, to achieve this uh, this goal, but I will try to make very clear for you uh, uh, in general, so you try to implement this on your projects, on, on your sessions, okay? So uh, let's start. I will start sharing my screen. Just a second. Ah, now you can see. Okay. So uh, as I told you, the idea is to talk about the sh real shift left, because it's not enough just testing and fixing. When you do, because a lot of companies and a lot of developers around the world, they just test and they do not fix vulnerabilities uh, with your, your problem. Yeah, but what about stop creating them? You know, what about we think uh, about security and everything before the software starts, before everything starts to be developed or built itself? So it will be uh, more easy to implement security from the beginning. And this is the real shift left that I want to present to you today. Okay. So uh, just before we start, uh, just a quick introduction of myself. I'm Cassio Pereira. I'm the chapter leader of DevSecond here in Poland. So I'll be running all this, not all the sessions, but at least presenting all the sessions. Of course, we're going to have guests and everything. I cannot present everything. It would be impossible for me. Today, I'm cybersecurity engineer at ABB here in Poland. It's a global company, and they basically, they create and they build everything, kind of hardware, software, robots. Everything comes from ABB, and it's really nice to work there. I have a lot of challenges and a lot of insights also to share with you and to share with the community to improve security as well for our colleagues, okay? But uh, even a bit more of background, yeah? But I, I'm 34 years. I usually don't have problem to say that I'm quite old already, but uh, that's that's how it is. I'm from São Paulo, Brazil. I'm basically uh, I'm based in Brazil, but now I am uh, living here in Poland and for sure I'll be living here for quite a while. Eh? I'm have, I have 20 uh, years already on the road. So I started all my career with software development. Then I moved to cybersecurity. Also, I was a teacher in some universities there uh, in Brazil, teaching for graduation, post-graduation, uh, in the development uh, side and also in the, in the security side, okay? 
Today, I told you I'm a cybersecurity engineer focused on application security. Basically, everything that needs application security and everything related to application security, DevSecOps, SDL, and so on, I am the guy, let's say. Okay, I also I am also a developer. Huh? Basically, every day I'm developing some script or some kind of software to help myself to integrate something. And once developer, you never uh, leave this. This let's say you never leave this position. Eh? You will always be coding uh, somehow. Yeah. Uh, about community, I really like to share knowledge. I really like to engage people, and it's a really pleasure. As I told you in the beginning, a huge pleasure to be able to do it again. We are doing our first live session, but we are going to focus also on, on, on physical sessions uh, on site because it's really important to meet people and to share this knowledge in, in you know, face to face is much better. But I have a YouTube channel. Of course, it's mainly focused on in Brazil. So every content is in Portuguese. You may find some English stuff, but still uh, there is a lot of con there are con a lot of content there. I have the DevSecOps podcast. I basically the host DevSecOps podcast, also uh, everything in Portuguese, but will be and the reason will be even more English content for you. Besides that, I have uh, founded and let's say started coordinating the Besides Krakow. So all Poland community, let's say, please join Besides Krakow community. We are running the first Beside in September. We can talk about uh, later or in another se uh, session. Okay. Also, the second Poland chapter, our first session is starting today. You may find me on the internet as Castle Developer. I have a few uh, a few interests that I really like, like robotics, cyber war stuff, artificial intelligence, but you know, it's a lot of stuff to study, but it's better be interesting in playing football or watching movies, other stuff that not technology because it's too much. But anyway, I really like this. Uh, so I'm using my free time also to share knowledge with people. And that, 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 that's how it happens. Okay. So basically, this is myself. And today we're going to talk about uh, three simple things, three simple pillars, let's say, regarding uh, the real shift to left. First one, DevSecOps, an already, an already accepted need. Okay, everybody already know that they need DevSecOps. Now you cannot uh, run from it. Okay. Second pillar is the shifting left, the dream. What is the dream of shifting left from the companies and from this cybersecurity perspective and application security? What everybody wants. Okay. And then we're going to talk about the real shifting left. How is to move to the left? as much as possible okay and the reality right or not now let's see let's understand a bit how it's gonna be okay and moving forward guys uh you may be familiar with this uh, flow right here okay and this flow is quite simple basically every software development or at, at least should be uh, these uh, this steps okay more or less these steps some uh, some process more steps uh, less steps but in general uh, this one okay so basically you have the code phase when you start coding okay of course based on requirements and so on but you have the coding phase then you build your application okay you have to build your application in order to uh, deliver it huh? then you have the test phase where you supposed to test your application from every kind of perspectives like quality performance stuff and security of course yeah? and then you have the deployment phase when you really deliver your application to the public somehow okay basically you have this idea but the point is uh, if you think about security security was done in the past and is still today uh in the end of this process as you can see in the picture i introduced here a new flow which is pen test or penetration testing okay and this is still happening in some companies but how this happens is the problem because it happens uh, not that often or not that or not how it should be so basically once a year one or another company they are running pen testing okay why what is why is the problem here because all the develop all the software it's already developed it's already built it's already tested and then it will be security tested but this security testing here it's basically already in production so if you have critical vulnerabilities if you have big problems regarding security there it will be live so you are already at risk okay so if some hacker discover this this uh, vulnerability it may exploit you and that's the problem also running this test once a year it's a big problem because you're gonna wait 12 months to discover if you have another problem or not and you are not developing once a year you are delivering software basically every day every week some companies every second every minute they have deployments to production okay like 
Facebook, like Amazon and, and, and so on. But okay, this was the model in the past. Still some companies are like this, but we are talking about shifting left. So we try to move left somehow. So someone one day had the brilliant idea to say, okay, we instead of instead of and also doing pen test can be still once a year or whatever, we we should do this testing of security before the release application, before deployment. Okay. So someone decided to put in a test phase secured stuff. And they kept pen testing once a year, but also they introduced uh, testing before. And when we talk about testing before, we can make a decision like, oh, maybe if my tests are not good enough, according to my threshold, according to whatever I decide or whatever my policy is, I will deploy it. Yes or not. But still, when they started this, they will deploy anyway. That's the, that's the thing. Okay. And believe me. I have worked in a few companies. You can check on my LinkedIn how many. And yeah, 80, 90% of them still do like this. So it doesn't matter what test says, it will deploy anyway. Because business first, right? That's the, that's the mindset of a lot of companies around the world. But okay. Then they moved the secured stuff. They introduced secured stuff testing on the testing phase. Okay. So they, okay, they have to start security. And basically it starts with SaaS solutions like uh, Sneak, for example, or Checkmark, for example, or whatever, Sonar Cube, for example. Okay. And SaaS stands for uh, static application security testing. Basically it's a scan of your code. Huh? So, okay. Basically like, like this, you think, okay, now I code, now I build my software and during the test, I will analyze my code uh, on a security perspective. I want to understand if this code has or not some vulnerabilities, and I will, but I will deploy anyway. That that was the mindset. But then we can make this better somehow, like uh, like this, for example. We can change the pen test because penetration testing should be there always. That's the point. That's my point. Okay, and but we don't need to do the classic pen test once a year. Okay, and some companies already reduce this period, let's say, in time. So they have every six months a fully pen test. Okay, we're going to talk about pen tests too later, but the fully pen test on everything like red teaming and such uh, twice a year, which is okay. Yeah, you have a fully test everything on your all your company, all your websites and so on uh, twice a year because it's expensive, because it takes some time to do it. So you can have like this. Also, your mindset about deployment may change. Like you are not deploying anyway. You may be forced to deploy sometimes. Sometimes based on what? Based on your security testing. And now we have introduced another tool here or another kind of testing, which is DAST, Dynamic Application Security Testing. When you think now, okay, I have two kinds of security testing, one from my code, another one from my application at runtime, from my APIs or whatever. And based on these test results, I will deploy it or not. Usually what company does, companies does is if I have some critical or high vulnerabilities discovered in my SaaS solution or my DAS solution, I will not deploy this application, which is, let's say, the gate model. Okay, it's past the gate or not past the gate, which is okay. I agree with this model and it's, it's very good to avoid vulnerabilities going to production environment. Okay, but still, we are talking about moving left and yeah? shifting left. We, we have a lot of left to move here, yeah? but it's already, uh, as I told you, a need that everybody knows and everybody already understands that they need. Okay, but what if someone have a brilliant idea like, okay, so we have already security testing, but instead of check security during the test phase, why I cannot check it before? Because on the test phase, if there is some problem, it's already some time doing some a few sprints already over, and uh, I should come back and fix this or how it's going on. Um, so that's not the really the best idea. But instead, we can move even left. So we keep the pen test twice a year, which is important. We are introducing security, not only moving security. Okay, so if you take pen test and doing the on the first line of code, it won't help you at, at all. Yeah? So don't confuse this. We keep every step. But we also move left because the idea is to have security as soon as possible, but during all phase that is needed. Okay, so that's the point here. So we have a still pen test twice a year. We still deploy sometimes based on our test solutions, but also we have now during the build phase. And of course, I put a dust here, but if you think 
clearly and technically Dask can only run after you have the, the application running. Okay, so Dust should be in test phase or still in the deployment phase, but Dust is still there. But the idea is, okay, you already built your application. You are already able to run your Dust test. That, 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 that's the point here. But now here you have, in, uh, I moved one step to the left. And also we have now another kind of security testing, which is SCA, software composition analysis, right? like sneak stuff, like checkmark, like Vera code. A lot of companies around the world does this. Also open source solutions. But the idea here is analysis of cyber, analysis of security itself on the components. So now you are understanding if your libraries and your third party libraries, your open source libraries on your project, if they have vulnerability or not. Okay. And this is such a critical thing. You do not choose to put or not SCA. You have to do it. Like SAS and like DAS from my perspective. And as I want you to understand. Okay. But now we move that still to the left and we are in the build phase during our security checks. So we can also deploy if you really want or based on our results and so on. But also we can move still one more phase to the left. Like if you think about coding, during the coding, what should be possible to test from the security perspective? Is it possible? Yes. You keep the twice a year pen test. You deploy sometimes based on your security results. You keep your SaaS, SCA, and DAS solutions. But during your code phase, you can also do some secure stuff like links or code reviews or links and code reviews. What is links, Cassio? Links are basically some plugins, some scripts, some tools that will help your code semantic uh actually will help you regarding your code semantic if they are if they they may have some vulnerability or not or some security issue or not okay you basically have some like link for this and other tooling but during your code while you are typing your code this kind of tooling is going to show you if you have a problem from the security perspective or not so it's even more left because if you think very clear, and this is a message for all the developers online, if you think very clear, you are creating the vulnerabilities. You are creating the bugs. So you somehow are responsible for that. You may, you may not be creating them uh, on purpose, which I believe you, are, you don't, but you still are creating them. So why not have some links helping you? Also, if you think very clear, you can move even your SAST and SCA testing to your IDE. You can run, run your SAST scan on your Visual Studio, on your Eclipse or whatever. You can run your SCA scan on your IDE itself because you already have the components. You don't need to wait for the build phase. You can still move all of that to the left and you can keep them on the build phase during your pipeline and CI CD stuff, which is great. But also you can move this even to the left. So your, let's say when the code is born, you are already taking care of the security there. Okay. And of course, the code review. Sorry, because I have two screens, guys. So I need sometimes moving here to see my pointer if it's in the right place. So the code review itself, it's a very um, nice approach because you can have pair programming, XP, and a lot of methodology that may help you also find security problems. Actually will help you find security problems. Of course, if this person's have the if this person have the knowledge to do this. Okay. But the idea is to how to secure and how to put security in each phase and left as possible, you can have on the code phase links and code review. Okay. So this is a let's say a big picture of how we can do this and of course how it's already uh, acceptable. Uh, that everybody knows that we need this somehow everybody knows that this is a kind of a, a basic model, okay? You cannot run from this. But we can go even further. If you see this picture here, it is quite a big picture. Uh, this, is the, this is not the real shift left, but this is the shift left, okay? That we are still in the coding phase and some tests, some secure testing and so on. But if you think on this flows, if you give a zoom on these flows, you're going to be, um, let's say, amazed how many steps you can have within it. Okay, so if you think now better in the code phase, you can have even more security testing like pre-commit hooks or pre-commit hooks. What they do, basically, if you have some, you can define some policies, but if you have some secrets, user and password on your code, and you are trying to commit this to your code base, like to your repo and so on, this kind of 
uh, sorry, this kind of tools are going to block your commit, which means this problem are not going to leave the the developer machine. It will stay there. It are not spreading the vulnerability because if you have a secret on the code and you commit it to the, you push it to the to the repository, uh, everybody who has access to the repository will know about the secret or will have access to the secret. So the idea is to block this kind of things before it goes out of the developer machine, okay? Of course, you can have IDE plugins, as I mentioned, uh, uh, linked stuff or SAS stuff or SCA stuff and so on, which is very important, okay? Code review, still people look into your code. Code review is a very nice activity that everybody, every, Every, I would say uh, bad words, but sorry, guys. But every uh, team, every development team, squad, whatever, they should do. They should have code review somehow, right? And, of course, repo policies. What is accepted on your on your repo? Are you going to push the code? This code is already tested on my SAS tool. This code has some vulnerability found. This code, this or that. You can define all these policies before the code being sent uh, to the repository. Okay, so you can have all these policies. And look, guys, I'm talking about code phase. More left than code phase, we're going to see further. But this technically is when, for the first line of code, you can have all these checks. From the first line of code, you can have all these checks. Okay, that's the point. I have some comment here. Let me check this comment. Who is sending this? Uh, just a second. At which step should we concern about bill of material? Oh, nice, nice uh, question from Rodrigo Balbino. Ah, very nice. So this is the question, guys. I will make stop here in the presentation just to answer this question, okay? He's asking, at which step? Should we be concerned about the bill of materials? Okay, if you are not familiar with SBOM or bill of materials, basically it's uh, let's say a big list of all components or everything that is in your software. So bill of materials is a kind of a SCA stuff. So if you think SCA here, when you see my pointer here, if you see about SCA, is when you start building your 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 bill of materials because. Software composition analysis tools, they will be providing you all the list of your components that you have. Some tools are very good, some, some tools are not. So you should also check if there are every component that you have in an application in order to have an S-bone to be delivered, which is basically a file or, or report. But if you think about S-bones, you are thinking about SEA, okay? Software composition analysis. And there are a few tools that can help you this. With this, basically, you have a OASP, I uh, forgot the name. You have a tooling from OASP, uh, dependence track, that can help you with this, okay? So this is the point. So basically, the step, to answer your question direct, directly, the step is on the pre-build, or still, if you think about SCA, as I can, I will say here later, you can, can be anticipated, as you can see here. SCA can be anticipated to the code phase. So in the code phase itself, you can be, uh, you can start being concerned about bill of materials. Okay, answered, Rodrigo. Also, we have another, another, another da, 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 question from Leticia Rezende. How to block in the pre-commit hooks? Ah, this is a nice question because if you think about pre-commit hooks, it will be a, um, kind of a script or a CLI or a client which will be running on the developer machine in the developer machine. And uh, these need to be configured according to some policies and so on, but on the in the developer machine. So imagine I'm a developer, I'm creating my code, my day, I, and I finish my day. Okay, now I need to commit this to the repository. Tomorrow you continue my job. On this commit, it will these plugins or clients will check this commit before it provided to the before it will send to the repository. So that's how uh, this pre-commit hooks will really block, okay? Basically, you configure your policies and the pre-commit hook itself will check if this commit is uh, matching the policy or not. If it's not matching, the commit is allowed. If it's matching some policies that you define, commit is blocked, okay? Basically, it's like this. I hope you have answered you or uh, I hope I have answered your, your question, Leticia, okay? Also, Rodrigo, just let me know if the if I answered correctly or if you need further clarification. Okay. <clears throat> Moving forward with our presentation, you have the code repository phase. Basically, uh, this is how to store safely store secret stuff like passwords, like API keys, and so on, not in your code, 
not in your config files because they are vulnerable by definition. Code can be in the code base. Everybody can have access. Config files, everybody can have access. But the secret management tool, not everybody have access. Na vault tool, not everybody has access or not everybody should have. So this is the proper tool to store secret stuff. Okay, secret management. It's not a password and, and, and user and password management. It's secret. Everything which is secret for application, config stuff, directory, uh, paths, API keys, whatever, you should store in a vault and your application should communicate with this vault in order to have all this, all this uh, information which is stored there, okay? Then you have the pre-build phase, okay? During your, let's say, on this uh, red square here, and this true in the middle, uh, basically you have the pre-build and post-build, and we are talking here about the CI-CD stuff, okay? Uh, your pipeline, basically. So during your pre-build, you can have your SAS scan. We already talked about SAS scan. You can have your SCA scan. We already talked about SCA. You can have also your IAC scan, infrastructure as code. Basically, every infrastructure today is based on the code, Ansible, Terraform, and, and so on. And also, you should check for this kind of uh, files because they may have uh, vul not vulnerability itself, but misconfiguration problems. And all this kind of uh, misconfiguration can lead you to a vulnerability in your, in your application in the production environment. Okay, So if you think about these three tools here, or these three kind of security checks, you have 100% of code coverage, which means you are security testing 100% of your code. SAS, let's say 30% of the software code, which is the code you produce from your business rules and so on. SCA, which is the other 70% of the application. All the open source, all the components you are importing to your application. And your infrastructure as a code when you are uh, provisioning your, your infrastructure and so on with this kind of, of uh, technology, okay? So here you have three tools to check your code 100%. And all this, it's in pre-build because during your pipeline, during your CI CD stuff, you should test security. But this also can be anticipated as I, as I mentioned here, and you can move all this to your code phase. Or not, actually, sorry, not move, but also add to your code phase. So during your development, you are checking SAST, SCA, ESA, okay? And also when you have your pipeline running, you can double check this as well, okay? Then you have your post build. When you already build your application, now you are preparing to uh, deploy it. So you can have container scan. Oh, everything now is Docker and container stuff and you should scan it. All your containers are based on an image, on a Linux image, on a Windows image or whatever. You should scan it because all of this can have reported vulnerabilities already. So you need to have a tool or a step on your development phase to check your containers images. Okay, It's very important. Also, malware scanning. Like, uh, what is malware scanning basically? Guys, if you are delivering software, Basically, you are delivering a jar file, DLL, executable file, whatever. What if in the middle of the process, someone has introduced a malware on this, uh, on this file? You don't know because you uh, usually developers after they commit, after the, the uh, repository phase, let's say, they're already not aware what happened in the code, how it's going to be built, how it's going to the production. Usually they have DevOps teams and other people to do this. So it's important to have a malware scanning because you never know what happens. So you make sure you are not delivering malware to your uh, to your customers or users or whatever. Okay. Also, it's important for some context to have code signing. You are delivering an execut executable file for your customer for a user. How this uh, customer user can check if this file is really uh, come from you. With code signing, you are code signing based on a, certif a certificate, and this customer can check uh, the identity, the or let's say the origin of this uh, of this file. Okay. Then you have the test phase when you introduce DAST. We already talked about DAST. I asked interactive application security testing, also pen testing here, but here is not that full pen test with everything. Here is a pen test with a scope. Pen test with a target, specific target to that deploy and to be quick, to be easy, and to have the results, trying to have these results before uh, production. Okay. Also, some requ requirements test. You may have some security requirements which cannot be checked 
uh, checked on the on those phases with automatic tools. You may have some manual testing. Okay, so you have the test phase for this. Also in the deployment, when you can have compliance as a code, also related to IAC, also and not less important, alert and monitoring. You need to have logs for everything, monitoring for everything, because if you don't know what happened in your application, probably only the hacker knows. Yeah, so it's it's very important to be aware of this. And of course, all of this supported by a vulnerability management process. And you may have, you may need KPIs for that. How many vulnerabilities, how many projects, what the, what the team, what the vulnerability most common on my, on my scans and so on. And vulnerability management, because this is all of this is about finding problems. All of this is about finding problems. Here we are, we are talking about prevention, okay? Prevention of, of problems. But here we are talking about finding problems. So finding problems, not your solution. You are finding them. You are discovering them. How about fixing them? So you need a vulnerability management process for this. Okay. Uh, but moving forward, let me uh, think here. Uh, moving forward, uh, all of this that I talked until now, so far, it's about finding problems. It's all about finding problems during your software development. But... Uh, if you think about the first line of code and everything uh, before your deployment and so on, guys, it's already started the software development. And my point is, at after first line of code, there is no way back. After you started creating your class, after you started creating your script, your API, whatever, there is no way back, especially on the developer's mindset. It will go only forward. Feature release, feature release, feature release. Sometimes fix a bug, release, fix a bug and release. Uh, sometimes, sometimes fix a, a vulnerability and release. So it's very hard. That's my point here. The real shift left is not on code. It's not on pipeline. It's not on DevSecOps. You will get there. But the point is, after first line of code, there is no way back. So we need to start security before this. Okay? That's the point of this presentation, guys. We're going to get there. Uh, if you think also about Agile, yeah, here we have uh, just a nice picture about the Scrum process. Everybody's familiar with this. If you are not, please uh, do a quick research about Scrum methodology. But if you think about Scrum, uh, uh, also, uh, we can introduce security. Because if you think about here, user stories or product vision, right? Product vision. And all the user stories here should already have all the security stuff. That's the point. When you think about Scrum process and any other methodology, you, you have something to deliver, you have something to build, okay? So this something to build should have everything needed to be a product. Usually what happens, in, especially in, in agile methodologies, is all the user stories, everything here is the software itself, not secured stuff, not no functional requirements, not documentation. And that's the problem because only will be taken care in the end, after the software in production and everything. So your product backlog, when defined, should have everything for your product. Your product should have security. Your product should have quality, performance, uh, user experience, good user experience, whatever. Everything should have should be in the product backlog. So when you start your cycles, when you start your sprint plannings and sprints and so on and so on, everything will be just taken from the product backlog and built and, de and delivered, okay? So that's the point here. Doesn't matter what the methodology, you can put security there. Actually, you have to put security there, okay? But here we are to this real security, to the real uh, shift left, to the real security, let's say. Because uh, here you have a bigger picture of that flow, which now we introduce two things, which is requirements and maintenance. Okay, you have the requirements to, to develop a, a software and you have the maintenance after in production and so on. You need to keep it running, you need to keep it healthy and so on. Also, we have the design phase here or architecture phase when some, um, some uh, teams uh, go, uh, like to call, okay? And here is the, sh the real shift left. Because if you think about a software, guys, software do not start in a code. Software do not start on Visual Studio. Software do not start on Eclipse. Software do not start on IDE. Software do not start with developers. Software start in business. Someone have an idea or a need for a software. And this person 
should start security. Okay, at least there we should start security, not this person itself, because it can be a business guy who just wants a software, just need a software. And before this start being a code or whatever, security should be there. And here is the point, okay? If you take the first thing on the software development life cycle phase, which is requirements, may, may you may find something there before, I'm not aware of, but you have the requirements, okay? You're going to list the requirements, okay? My software needs to have email, my software needs to have a login page, my software needs to have this, this, and that. If you take the first thing, the real left stuff, which it is, is, is requirements, okay? If you, take, if you think about requirements itself, you have some four kind of requirements. You have some four, no, you have four uh, kind of, of requirements. You have the requirement itself, actually three guys, I'm sorry. I'm looking to the, to the slides and, and, and losing my, 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 my thinking here, but you have three kinds of, of requirements. The functional requirements, okay? What needed to software run? What, what is needed in the software? What software exists for? Functional requirements. Then you have non-functional requirements. Software should be fast. Software should be nice and easy to use. This kind of thing. And you have sometimes security requirements. And when you have security requirements, usually it came from a threat modeling. Okay, threat modeling is what I like to say, the art of finding security problems before the software exists. Threat modeling is the art of finding security problems before the software exists. And I can bet here 10% of all software in the world do threat modeling somehow. But it's another topic. So you have security requirements, uh, sometimes from threat modeling, sometimes someone think about some requirements and they will put there for you. But here is a problem because usually companies will think about business first and business only. So the functional requirements are enough to software being delivered to the production, to the customer, to the user, whatever. So if the functional requirements are sometimes not even 100%, you may have one bug here, one bug there, but they will deliver because business needs to run. Okay. And all known functional requirements, we see it later. Software is not running, uh, is not speed, uh, is not fast enough. Oh, we see it later, fix later. Software is not a uh, user experience uh, good enough. We see it later. Important is to be up and running online. But so, so security requirements, so we, we even think about it. Okay, this is, a, this is a big problem. So if you have these steps, it's a problem because they can be dropped during the software development. And that's my point here. If you take the requirement itself, okay, we're still talking about the requirement, which is the real left stuff during the software development life cycle and you think like this you're gonna you are not having any more security requirements i don't need security requirements we don't need security requirements like okay Cassio, are you crazy we are talking about shift left devsecops security it's the kickoff session of DevSecOps component chapter are you crazy talking that we don't need security requirements yes guys we don't need security requirements what we need it's a functional requirement clear enough to already have security there without even thinking. So it will be built because it's a functional. To, to make the software work, everything here in the functional requirement must be implemented. It's not optional, okay? So how? We can have security already on our functional requirement. That's the point. That's the point, guys. Think about it. If you have a developer, it will look, okay, you have the functional requirement. You need a login page. Okay, basically user and password. Click a button, send a message if it's not okay, and, and move to the authenticated page if it's okay. That's it. It's functional. It's already working. But um, I didn't say about, how about brute force attacks? How about encryption of this data? Because it's critical data, user and password. How about social engineering? How about this, this, and that? So. You don't need to have security requirements separately. You must have your functional requirements well described with security already. That's the point, okay? How we get there? Easy, very easy, guys. Think about this. We don't need to read the whole slide, okay? I'm not reading also for you. But here is described a login page uh, requirement example. Basically, you have user, you have password, and a button for login. 
you're going to put the user, you're going to put the password, system will validate, drop a message if it's some problem, and go on. That's the point of this requirement. Very simple, very straightforward. Everybody's familiar with this, okay? But as I told you, it's a, a functional requirement. If the developer read this and a login page you can create, guys, come on, one hour, two hours, depends on the framework. Right? You may have already done in every language possible language. You just copy and paste it. You have your login page up and running. But here, there is no, there is nothing about security. What about some topics that I put in here? Like, what about brute force attacks? There should be a captcha that must be solved prior to login. You cannot log in without a captcha. It's Kind of trivial to say something like this from a security perspective. What about encryption? Username and password must be encrypted using algorithm, whatever, uh, either during transport of this data, during storage of this data. Because if you think about social engineering, what about the message on a wrong login must not specify if the username or login are wrong? It's a social engineering problem. What if the developer, okay, uh, username is okay, but password is wrong. What if they drop a message to the to the uh, UI like, oh, this password is wrong. So the attacker is already know that the username is fine. So it will start a brute force because they know already a valid user. So this should be a concern. Software shouldn't even exist without this kind of checks from my perspective and from security perspective. What about login and monitoring? Each login attempt must be, must be registered with that least minimum data. Blah, 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 date, time, uh, get, post, uh, URL, whatever, uh, including the status. It was logging success, logging not. Because, for example, if you have too much not success logging, you may have a, you may, are may facing a brute force attack. So you may be, you may have uh, take an action on this. Okay. So this is critical. Okay. And so on. I put it here, uh, three dots, because all the secret stuff should be thought here. So the same secure, the same requirement here is the software functional requirement. And here you have at least four security requirements. And all these companies out there, please guys, share this with your boss, with your business guys, share this. All these four security requirements, they will be dropped somehow if it will be delay on your delivery. If you have a target market, if you have something to deliver, your login page is working. Yes. So, okay, we do brute force attack protection after. Okay, we do encryption after. Okay, we do social engineering protection after. We could do log monitoring one day. That's the problem of, of security, guys. To leave security after. Ah, tomorrow I see this. Let's put on backlog. No, it's top priority on our backlog. For sure, it's going to be there one year if it will be taken care of. So my point of the real shift left is your, your functional requirement must be complete security approach. You must have a login page security requirement, a software requirement with security stuff already there. So when the, the system analysis, when the developer read this, it will build already with all this. Ah, Cassio, but you are talking about login monitoring. You, it, may not, it may not be a developer stuff. Okay. No problem, but the requirement for the software itself to be in the production, someone needs to fulfill it. DevOps, production guys, infrastructure guys, I don't know. Logs, monitoring need to be enabled somehow. So in order to the software being delivered, the requirement must be fulfilled. And the requirement must demand developer effort, DevOps effort, infrastructure effort, and whatever. So that's the point, okay? Moving forward. Uh, how this happened? How the secret stuff come from? Where they come from? Usually on the architecture phase, somebody is thinking about this. If you have the security guy or whatever uh, during the threat modeling phase, they are doing this on the design phase or architecture phase. Okay, but to have this in the in the requirements phase, it's harder because you do not have software, you do not have components, you do not have traffic, you don't know how it will be working. Okay, so how you do it? You keep your threat modeling on the design phase because you're going to have architecture diagrams at least, a, a, a data flow diagram at least, so you can have a proper threat model. But with the list of the requirements, you can have a brainstorm threat model. You already know 
you have a login page, you have a database, you have an API, they will communicate somehow. You can do your brainstorm threat modeling before architecture phase. Stop lying to me. You can do it. I know you can do it. I do it. Okay, guys, it's not the 100% threat modeling, but you still, you can start here. So from here, you can already take the brainstorm threat modeling. So all the threats that you identify already, they will already be or provide you somehow the security countermeasures or the security mitigation stuff. So it's how you change your requirements to not have functional requirement and security requirement. Instead, you're going to change your functional requirement to be with security already. Okay, is it clear? People are with me. Guys, live, please comment, please send questions. And if you are seeing this recorded, please send questions, comment on, on the YouTube video, join us on the Discord. I will be answering everything, okay? Of course, it will be 1,000 million uh, questions. It may be hard, but I will try, I promise. But uh, moving forward, guys, the problem here is for the requirements definition, to take your requirements, your functional requirement, and put security there, you need a security person. Usually the developers, system analysis or architect guy, they will not have the security point of view. So you need to involve the security team or security guy, whatever, and depends on the company there. Like some companies call it security champion, security owner, security engineer. I don't care. I don't care how is the name. If the security guy put it there already, when the requirements are being defined, when the requirements are being listed on, Okay, you are agile, no problem. Put the same guy to define your user stories, your product backlog. Make him join the planning meetings, the daily meetings, every meetings, because it's security stuff. The thing is not to be security, uh, the thing is not to be business first, but to be business first, security always. Guys, I need to write you down. Wait a second, wait a second. You need to, you need to fix this. Business first, security always. Opa, just a second. Business first, security always. Here, this is what you need. Where uh, here, business first, security always, guys. Because only business first, business first, business first. Where's the security? Also, if you think security first, it won't happen because a business starts as a business, not a security. Business needs security, always, not sometimes, and not never, of course. So the business is first, guys. Here's the, here's the thing. Business is first, but security is always, not sometimes, not maybe. Security is always. And if you don't have this big picture that I showed you, DevSecOps stuff, all the automations, all the security tests and so on, you will not have security always. If you don't put the real shift left as, I, as I'm, I'm presenting here, you will not have security first, uh, security always because you are leaving security out of requirements phase. So it's not always anymore. It's during the coding, during the design, during all the other phases, but requirements, no. And the requirements, guys, is where the software is born. Software is described in the requirements phase. So every requirement must have secured stuff. Okay? Good. Moving on. You have also, you need to have also training. If you, if you see the Microsoft, go to microsoft.com uh, slash SDL. I'll write you down, microsoft.com slash SDL. Sometimes I have a Polish words in my mind, sometimes Portuguese Sorry, guys, but I will be trying to be focused, okay? So if you go to microsoft.com um, slash SDL, you're going to find the Secure Develop Lifecycle Framework, okay? So you have there the first step, training. But what I'm talking about here is not training to developers, not training to technical guys. They already know. They already been trained probably. If not, you should be. But this training for the user and business guys because they are they are the people who are saying okay i need this software they are they are basically creating the requirements to some system analysis uh, write this down and provide to the developer and so on so if they have already security in mind they will also create or de demand more and better let's say 
uh, uh, requirements because they think like security also. Of course, they will not be security experts. They will not be security best guys in the world. No. But if they say, okay, I need this requirement of the software. Oh, but uh, it's the financial data. So I may, I sh so I should uh, be aware of uh, GDPR stuff. I should be aware of encryption stuff. I should be aware of hacker stuff, whatever. But if he, he already knows about something, it will start coming from them also, the need from security, not on technical guy stuff, which they must have. Okay, so this is a really nice approach. And also, you should have a baseline, define a baseline. Here where I work, for example, we have the MCSR, Minimum Cyber Security Requirements. We have few requirements from the cybersecurity perspective that every software must have. It's the minimum. It's not sometimes, it's not at least, no, it's the minimum. Needs to have this. There is no software without this minimum cybersecurity requirement. So you may have yours. Like, guys, I'm from today, from, from now on, we are not delivering any software with hard coded credentials, for example. Whatever. So you may have your list of uh, requirements that you are not accept to deliver from the security perspective. So this will help you, will guide you with your functional requirements, with all your SDL, with your DevSecOps stuff. Okay, this will be very helpful for you. Before moving on, I have some comments here. Uh, actually, before Leticia's, Leticia and Rodrigo said that their questions were uh, answered. Like here, you say yes, thanks. Rodrigo also thanks. Okay, thanks you guys for the questions. Uh, Leticia also is um, sending another question, which is like using the misuse cases at the threat modeling brainstorm. Perfect. Very smart girl. She's telling, okay, guys, to have this uh, security stuff on the requirements already, if you have the misuse cases as threat modeling brainstorm, it will be perfect. If you are not familiar with use case diagram and so on, you should not be developing software at all. That's, the, that's another problem, okay? But if you have already your use case diagram, you can have your misuse case diagram. Imagine a hacker interacting with your system, how it should be, how, how it would do, how he would do, he or she would do. So that's the point. If you have the misuse case, you already have all, all you need for a, secure, for a functional requirement with secured stuff inside. Perfect, Leticia. Perfect. Thank you for this question. And also she's putting another, com another comment, which is, but how to make the company or teams involve the secured team? Isn't it a hard culture to change? Uh, let me breathe. <clears throat> Let me breathe to answer this because it's, yes, the question is, yes, it's hard. But the point is, Leticia, uh, I'm from Brazil and uh, we are, unfortunately, we are a top one, two or three in the world in frauds and malwares and, you know, schemes and all this kind of thing. And these make us think better about security, okay? So when you talk about culture, uh, to me, it's already like we must have security. It's not optional. We do not trust to trust the user. We do not trust my own colleague on my company. We do not trust. So you have this kind of mindset, you know, trust and so on to do not to think about it, to do not deliver something without thinking on this kind of stuff. But going directly to your question, like how to involve um, teams and company involve the security guys, right? I think that's the point. You know, from one side, you have the mindset of the company, the criticality of the business also. If you are dealing with critical stuff in the business, by definition, you should be already worried about this, like banks, financial stuff, critical data, critical infrastructure, should be, okay? But some other companies like, ah, I'm just in e-commerce, uh, you know, selling, you know, sweets or whatever. They will not, maybe not, okay, we are a simple company, nobody will attack us or something. And that's the problem, right? They do not take care of security itself. Though. My point of view is, uh, unfortunately, uh, a real good incident will motivate security. So to to make like to make this change, to make the company really be scared and really be, really be involved in cybersecurity, they must suffer, or they must suffer, or they start with this. Because if they do not suffer, they will say, "Ah, okay, basically, I don't need to take care because I'm not target." 
what which hacker in the world would want to, to install my data or my company? No, we are small. And this mindset must change. And it will change when it's something bad happen, unfortunately. Or uh, this approach, like we're having these meetups, conference, you know, people start talking about this. And that's the point of DevSecOn community. We are spreading this kind of information to the developers. Developers created the softwares, to the business people, to the DevOps people, to the database people, to the infrastructure people. doesn't matter who. If you are involved in a software development life cycle, somehow you can be a company of software development, you can be HR, but it doesn't matter. You are in this middle. If you are in this, uh, in this let's say, area, you should be aware somehow in your level. So that's the point. We should talk more about this, more and more and more. It's an uh, ant job. In Brazil, you say anti job, you know, like ants, small ants doing small jobs. So it will start spreading. So that's the point. Yeah, that's the point. But it's hard. It's hard to change culture, mindsets of the, of the developer. Another thing which I, I see already, I saw already uh, happening and, and working is the top down stuff. Like, the CIO of the company say, to, from now on, we do not deliver software without SaaS scan. From now on, we do not deliver software. We do not uh, let the pipeline run if break the build, if there is a vulnerability, for example. So top-down stuff works. Also, you have the, you know, from another side, you stop delivering so fast because you may have a lot of vulnerabilities and security problems, but it's another approach. Okay, so I'll put here my... It's two point of views, like or stop down stuff, or it's you know talking more, talking more, talking more about this to try to try to change uh, people's mindset. Okay, did I answer your two questions? Just send me a, a a okay or not, so I can clarify for you. Okay, guys, we are almost no, we are not almost running out, out of the time because we have time. So uh, moving to the end of our presentation, we still have uh, two things to think about it. If you are talking about requirements, okay, so you have the requirements. Perfect. Already my requirements is with security. Also, during the test phase, which is there, now, is, not, is on the right now. But moving to the left, you have the requirements defined. You have the security stuff. It will help you test your software better because you have a baseline. You have everything established from the beginning. It will help define some test cases and so on. So these two guys here will be even more connected. That's the, that's the thing, okay? So all the definitions and test cases will be easier because you have everything defined before the requirements. It will help your security testing. You do not need to, for example, run a dust scan and crawl your whole application. No, you may have your specific or you are allowed to test. During your all development life cycle, you identified something like this. Or... And you have baseline. And if you have baseline definitions, you can have automation for all this. If you define, okay, no more hard-coded credentials will be accepted in our code base. Awesome. You may create a rule on your pre-commit hooks, a rule on your SAS scan to avoid these kind of things. So it will be automated. You, because remember, I just talked about the trust. We do not trust developers, users, nobody. We are security. We do not trust even on our security. And that's the mindset, guys. So please, if you have baseline, you have automation. Automation, have checks, you have auditing. That's how you make security always. Not secured sometimes, okay? Also, all definitions plus baseline, you can have KPIs. Okay, from all the definitions I have and baseline that I defined and then I automated, what is the KPIs? How many matches I have, how many uh, requirements I have that I'm not fulfilling, how the teams are developing and, and delivering. So you can have all these kind of checks if you have automation, of course. Uh, then your, uh, your SDL in general, stop being a gate. Security actually stop being just a gate. Oh, we developed everything. Six months of work. Now we need to go to the security. They need security boring guys. They need to approve our software and so on. And so on. no, that's not the idea because this is secret. Sometimes secret won't work like this. So secret stop being just a gate. Secret starts to be a double check because secret always remember all develop phase we we talked about during this presentation during all your phases of your software development life cycle you're going to have security so and on the test phase it's just a double check it's just to see oh it was done or not and this is the perfect model okay 
And also, you will avoid bypasses. You will have less bypass. What is this kind of bypass? You develop your software. Now you're in the release phase. You're going to release, you're going to deploy to the production. But you need to do security tests. And someone who is going to test security and say, oh, you have a really critical vulnerability here. But remember, it's business first, not security first. So business will say, guys, it's very critical. We understand the risk, but we need to go production. And this risk may have, may be your user's data, inf critical infrastructure, money, whatever. And it will be in production at risk because it's business first. Doesn't matter. So to avoid being at risk, all this must be put in place. Okay? That's the thing here. Guys, thank you for all my Poland, Polish community. Dziękuję bardzo. Uh, it was a pleasure to have this kickoff session with you. Please, you find me, all my links, you know, even our good stuff, you can find it on this link tree slash Castle Developer. Of course, devseccon.io slash Discord community. Please join our Discord community. There we will be, you know, discussing more, talking more and enjoying, making everybody on the Polish community. And of course, everybody around the world who may uh, be seeing this presentation to join us and to discuss about security, to talk about security. Because that's the point, guys. We need to talk more and more and more and put more effort and make security happen. It's not only, of course, talk about security, but make it happen. Okay, for sure, 1% of this presentation that I shared today, if you take 1% of this and make it happen on your company, it will be already better. If you have zero, go to level one. If you are in level one, go to level two and move forward. Do not stuck at some point. Improve your security every day. Okay, so please, 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 please join our Discord community on DevSecCon. And of course, uh, follow me, my channel, whatever you want on my, on my, on my link link tree uh link okay let me just uh stop okay i just stopped my presentation uh guys do we have any more questions i see there are a few people online so please uh drop a few questions if you still have we can have this you know quick chat at the end it was already one hour three minutes but it's okay uh leticia uh, said that was okay yeah, yeah, my, my, my answer for your question. Okay, thank you very much. Dziękuję bardzo. Uh, what else? Let me see if there are comments here. No, no more comments. But okay, guys, that's no problem. You leave your comment on the video. And of course, again, join our Discord community. Guys, that's all. Thank you very much for joining this first session, this kickoff session of DevSecom Poland chapter, which I'm the lead. Of course, if you want to talk, ah, Cassio, I want to present something that's a component chapter. Okay, talk to me. You're gonna ha you have the the CTP. No, CFP, sorry, the call for papers for DevSecon. You just submit your, your presentation. It will come to me. We set up a meetup. We set up an online session, whatever, and we make it happen, okay? For all uh, Polish uh, community, actually, Krakow community, Next session of DevSecond Poland chapter will happen in September. Let me see. September 7. Okay. September 7. From 6 p.m. It will be face-to-face. -face. It will be physical. It will be in place. Okay. Join our meetup on meetup.com. You'll find their DevSecond uh, community. Please join the Poland chapter. It will be shared there. Okay. The link, the details, the address, and everything for free okay always for free you do not pay anything you just need to be there on time to see a presentation okay it will have um we already have one session uh, scheduled i will try to find uh, more sessions maybe one two three let's see but we already have one so we already have the date 7 of, sept of september uh it will be a uh, wednesday and at 6 p.m Okay, here in Krakow, Poland. So all the community which is here based in Krakow, please join. If you are not in Krakow, but you are in Poland and you will be around, join us also. You are very welcome. Okay, zapraszam. And I'm still trying my Polish, so maybe one day will be fully Polish stuff. But for now, let's keep it in English. Okay, guys. Very good. There is uh, another comment from Rodrigo. Very good presentation. Thank you. Thank you for watching. Also from Leticia, thanks for the presentation. Thank you for watching. Guys. 
just final comment. Uh, that's all for today. Please stay tuned for the next session that will be Krakow, okay, in, in, uh, in person. Um, very thanks to myself because I prepared that presentation and to present to you. It was really nice uh, to talk to you about this today and to help you, uh, you know, improving and listening and understanding how we can uh, improve security uh, in general, okay? Thank you all for listening for being here live with us today. Uh, if you are seeing this, of course, recorded and later, that's no problem. Join our live session next time. But please, drop your comments on your YouTube channel, okay? Drop your comments, drop your message, drop your questions. I'll try to make everything clear and, and answer for everybody, okay? Oh, there is a, there is a last comment from Gabek. Your polish is very good. Thanks for the presentation. Dziękuję bardzo, Gabek. Very good. Also... Send this to your team. I know you're a manager. I know you're the good guy who has all this, you know, stuff that to do So and to deal, of course. So share with your team, share with your colleagues. We need to improve security in general everywhere. Guys, again, thank you very much. It was a pleasure, a huge pleasure to have this kickoff session. Just join us. Just please come and we'll be very happy to run our next session. Thank you all. See you in the next session, guys. Bye-bye.